on World News Tonight. Mass evacuation. Ukraine stumbles under the pressure of Russia's continuing onslaught with frantic efforts to move civilians to yet Ukraine-controlled areas. Rejecting Russia, the EU is moving towards taking a stand against Russia with even stricter repercussions for the country. What comes next for the oil giant? Find out tonight. Unprecedented hikes. The US Federal Reserve announces the biggest rate hike in 22 years as it seeks to tame soaring inflation, impacting all aspects of life in America. And celebrating youth, China puts together a night full of splendor as dazzling performances commemorate the day of youth. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top story today still leads with the war in Ukraine. Russian forces launched a major assault on the Avzostal steel plant, the last holdout of Ukrainian forces in the devastated southern port city of Mariupol, as 101 civilians who had been trapped in the site for weeks were finally brought to safety. On these buses, the few who have been able to escape a nightmare. After a two-day delay, the United Nations and Red Cross-led convoy arrived to relative safety in Ukraine-controlled Zaporizhia. The 100 evacuees on board, women and children under 18, spent the last few weeks sheltering in Mariupol's Azovstal steel plant. Humanitarian organizations and NGOs were on standby, there to provide both physical and psychological support. We can only imagine that the people who have spent a lot of time under the bombardment in these conditions will perhaps have profound mental traumas. The convoy's route to Zaporizhia was kept under wraps as they had to travel through Russian-backed separatist territory, including Bezimen. Before their arrival, Ukrainian officials emphasized the difficulty of the evacuation process. Everything is very fragile. Things can fall apart at any given moment. Citizens not sheltering in the steel plant in Mariupol had taken advantage of a delicate ceasefire that began Sunday. They escaped to Zaporizhia in their own cars, desperate to leave the besieged port city that's faced some of the worst shelling since the start of Russia's war. The evacuation may have been the last chance at relative safety for the some 200 civilians still trapped in the steelworks factory, including dozens of children. Russia's attacks on the plant have resumed. The European Union proposed its tougher sanctions yet against Russia, including a phased oil embargo as Ukraine came under further heavy Russian bombardment and nervously monitored large-scale army drills in neighboring Belarus, a close ally of Moscow. The European Union proposed a phase-out of all Russian crude supplies within six months on Wednesday. The EU's chief executive made the announcement along with other planned new sanctions for Moscow following its invasion of Ukraine. An embargo would be a key moment for the bloc, which is heavily reliant on Russian energy and must find alternative supplies. Today we are at European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. And let's be clear, it will not be easy because some member states are strongly dependent on Russian oil, but we simply have to do it. So today we will propose to ban all Russian oil from Europe. Von der Leyen said refined products would also be phased out by the end of the year and pledged to minimize the impact on European economies. Oil prices jumped 3% with the announcement. The EU also targeted Russia's top lender Sberbank and two other banks and proposed removing them from the SWIFT international payments network. Second, we finally de-SWIFT Sparebank. Sparebank is one of the, is the largest Russian bank. It holds round about 37% of the whole banking sector. And we will also de-SWIFT to other major banks in Russia. The Commission's proposals now go to the bloc's 27 member states for approval. An EU source told that two countries, Hungary and Slovakia, would likely be allowed to buy Russian crude until the end of 2023 under existing contracts. Now we move on to the flight against inflation. The US Federal Reserve raised its benchmark policy rate by half a percentage point, which is the most in just over two decades in line with market expectations. The central bank will also start balance sheet reductions from June. 
The Federal Reserve on Wednesday raised interest rates by half a percentage point, the biggest single rate hike since the year 2000, and said it would begin trimming its bond holdings next month. The combined measures, hiking rates and selling bonds, significantly slash the sort of economic aid that the Fed has relied on to boost growth. But that's a risk that Chairman Jay Powell is willing to take to tame what he sees as an even greater threat, surging inflation. I'd like to take this opportunity to speak directly to the American people. Inflation is much too high, and we understand the hardship it is causing, and we're moving expeditiously to bring it back down. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. Powell telegraphed Wednesday's move long in advance, and financial markets have priced in further rate hikes through this year and into the next. The impacts of these moves might be felt everywhere from the housing market to the jobs market, where higher rates could stymie hiring and business investment, but that's the trade-off. The Fed hopes that by raising borrowing costs, U.S. consumers might slow spending and help bring down price inflation that is now more than three times the Fed's 2% target. But the central bank is trying to thread a needle. It needs to avoid raising rates too high or too fast, which could trip up the economy and raise the risk of recession. Those fears grew after U.S. GDP shrank 1.4 percent in the first quarter of 2022. Chief investment strategist Sam Stovall of CFRA Research says the Fed needs to move quickly to choke off inflation without strangling the overall economy. What they're hoping to accomplish is to engineer a soft landing. By that, I mean uh, what we saw in 1994, seven rate increases in 13 months, did not throw the economy into recession, but rather caused it to slow. Uh, and so that's what they're hoping to do this time as well. And while the Fed is expected to raise rates more quickly now in a dash to quash soaring prices, inflation will also depend on things beyond the Fed's control, the ongoing pandemic the war in Ukraine, and supply problems related to both. The economy is strong and is well positioned to handle tighter monetary policy. So, but I'll say, I do expect that this will be very challenging. It's not going to be easy. And it may well depend, of course, on events that are not in our, under our control. The leak of a draft U.S. Supreme Court ruling overturning the landmark Roe v. Wade apportioned rights decision shows a one-state body creaking under pressure as its increasingly assertive conservative majority looks to upend the law on a range of major issues. The unprecedented leak of a U.S. Supreme Court document not only exposed its intention to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade abortion rights decision, but also pulled the curtain back on a court whose lofty reputation as the grown-up branch of government could be slipping away. The breach of confidentiality contributes to a growing sense that all is not well within the court's marble hallways, where political leanings are supposed to be left at the door. The disclosure of the draft, which would overturn a nearly 50-year-old precedent, is the latest in a string of controversies to ensnare the high court. Conservative Justice Clarence Thomas has been under fire from Democrats over actions taken by his wife, Ginny Thomas, an outspoken supporter of former President Donald Trump. After the 2020 election, she encouraged GOP leaders to have the result overturned based on Trump's false claims of widespread voter fraud. Conservative Justice Neil Gorsuch drew scrutiny in January when he was the only person inside the courtroom not to wear a face mask during the surge of the Omicron coronavirus variant. That prompted headlines suggesting this ruffled liberal justice Sonia Sotomayor, whose diabetes is a risk factor for COVID complications. The two then tried to clear the air with a joint statement saying that while they sometimes disagreed on the law, they were, quote, warm colleagues and friends. And liberals are still furious at actions taken by Republicans to ensure that Trump could appoint three justices during his four years in office, Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, pushing the court to the right. One law professor told that it seems like, quote, the longstanding norms of the institution are under a severe amount of pressure. The apparent cracks come as the court's assertive conservative majority looks to upend the law on a range of major issues. By the end of June, the justices are not only expected to issue the abortion ruling, but could also greatly expand gun rights. And they have agreed to take up a case that could end affirmative action at universities. 
Beijing returned to work today after a five-day Labor Day holiday with China's capital on high COVID alert as it tries to eradicate an outbreak it has managed to limit to dozens of new cases a day for about two weeks. The capital streets were slightly less busy than on a normal working day as authorities have encouraged people to work from home and the closure of scores of bus routes and more than 10% of subway stations as part of COVID precautions has complicated commuting. Still, many subway trains looked crowded and office districts were busy. Many people took to bicycles to get around. Some isolated lockdowns of residential buildings and the closure of gyms, restaurants and other venues remained in force. Even so, residents were unenfazed by the extension of COVID-19 curbs on many public venues, such as authorities stepped up efforts in line with the country's uncompromising zero-COVID policy. Mainland China reported over 5,000 new coronavirus cases, of which 373 were symptomatic and the over 4,000 were asymptomatic. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres met with Nigerian leaders at the end of a two-day visit to Nigeria and three-nation trip to Africa. He fully supported moves to expand facilities to reintegrate surrendering Islamist insurgents because it was a key step to achieving peace in Africa's most populous nation. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on Tuesday he fully supported moves to reintegrate surrendering Islamist insurgents in northeastern Nigeria. The country has been fighting Islamist group Boko Haram and its offshoot Islamic State West Africa province for more than a decade. The conflict has killed thousands and forced millions to flee their homes. As part of efforts to end the conflict, the government is reintegrating fighters who voluntarily surrender. Speaking after his visit to a camp housing some fighters who surrendered and another housing internally displaced persons in Borno state capital, Maduguri, Guterres said the integration program would help achieve peace. I want to appeal strongly to the international community to understand Borno as a state of hope to support humanitarian action in Borno, must to recognize the enormous challenges that Borno faces with climate change, with still Boko Haram active, even if weakened, and to invest in the Borno of hope. However, the reintegration of the fighters is still creating tensions in Maduguri. Weary citizens have borne the brunt of more than a decade of Boko Haram's brutal attacks. The Borno state government in December started closing some camps for internally displaced people, citing improved security and the surrender of Boko Haram fighters. But humanitarian groups say it is still unsafe for people to return to their homes. Police in Armenia detained more than 200 anti-government protesters as opposition parties upped pressure on Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan over his handling of a territorial dispute with Azerbaijan. Demonstrators took to the streets of Yerevan on Tuesday. Their target, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, for his handling of a dispute with Azerbaijan. The two countries have been locked in a decades-long dispute over the Nagorno-Karabakh region. A six-week war in 2020 claimed more than 6,000 lives before ending with a Russian-brokered ceasefire. We demand the resignation of Nikol Pashinyan and his government as soon as possible, so we can resume our place on the world stage. We want dignified peace, without unilateral concessions, so we can improve security in Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia. Under the Moscow-mediated deal, Armenia ceded swathes of territory it had controlled for decades. The pact was seen in Armenia as a national humiliation and sparked weeks of protests. Pashinyan then called snap elections, which his civil contract party won last September. However, people expressed their anger on the streets again this week. Ethnic Armenian separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh broke away from Azerbaijan when the Soviet Union collapsed. Years of ensuing conflict claimed around 30,000 lives. Amber Heard took the stand for the first time in the now four-week trial. Heard took the witness stand in a Virginia court during Depp's defamation lawsuit against her, a make-or-break moment for both actors in a four-week trial that had so far largely focused on Depp's version of events during that turbulent 15-month marriage. 
he grabbed me by the arm, um, and he kind of just held me on the floor, screaming at me. Um, I don't know how many times he hit me in the face. Actress Amber Heard choked back tears Wednesday as she testified in a defamation case brought by her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. She told a Virginia jury that Depp physically abused her multiple times. Slapped me across the face. She said the first incident happened after she laughed at one of his tattoos. He said, you think it's so funny? You think it's funny, bitch? You think you're a funny bitch? And he slapped me again. I just stared at him because I didn't know what else to do. And he slaps me one more time. Hard. Hurt spoke of how she met Depp and how the couple had a magical relationship. Like, kind, sweet, velvety love. <laughs> Until, she said, it turned violent. He was also this other thing. And that other thing was awful. She alleged that Depp became violent, usually when he was drinking or using drugs, saying he would hurl insults or accuse her of cheating. It would escalate to the point where he would push me or shove me down. Earlier in the trial, Depp testified that he never hit her and that she was the one who was the abuser in their relationship. Bang, it'll just, uh, she clocked me in the jaw. Depp is suing the 36-year-old for $50 million, saying she defamed him in a Washington Post opinion piece when she claimed she was the victim of domestic abuse. Heard has countersued for $100 million, saying Depp smeared her by calling her a liar. Heard on Wednesday said it was hard to relive their relationship in the courtroom. This has been one of, the, this is the most painful and difficult thing I've ever gone through, for sure. Elon Musk said Twitter might soon charge fees for certain users as a billionaire continues to tease how he might change the platform as its new owner. Elon Musk said on Tuesday that Twitter might charge for commercial and government accounts to use the social media site. The Tesla CEO, who struck a deal to buy Twitter for $44 billion last week, said any fee would be slight and that Twitter would always be free for casual users. Twitter declined to comment. It's part of Musk's push to grow the platform's revenue, which is behind large arrivals like Meta's Facebook. Last week, Musk reportedly told banks he would develop new ways to monetize tweets. That would include making money out of tweets that go viral or contain important information. Musk attended the Met Gala in New York Monday, where he said Twitter's reach was currently niche and that he wanted a much bigger percentage of the US to be on the site. After signing the deal to buy Twitter, Musk said he wanted to enhance the platform with new features, defeat spam bots, and authenticate all humans. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Russia has imposed an entry ban on 63 Japanese individuals, including Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The list includes many high-ranking officials, including the country's top diplomat, defense minister and the chief cabinet secretary. South Korea became the first Asian country to be a part of the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. The nation's top intel agency signaled its intention to join through a letter in 2019 and has taken part in the world's largest cybersecurity training exercise ran by the center, known as Locked Shield, for two years since 2020. The Presidential Transition Committee strongly condemned North Korea's ballistic missile test. They called it an outright violation of the UNSC resolutions, as well as provocations that threaten peace, not just on the peninsula, but in East Asia and the international community. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson cast his vote in the country's local elections. Every local council seat in Scotland, Wales and London is being contested, with many more across the rest of England, adding up to a total of 200 local authorities. French President Emmanuel Macron welcomed Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Paris for a work meeting on the situation in Ukraine and bilateral cooperation between the two countries. As the United States approaches 1 million COVID-19 deaths, a nationwide blood survey issued by the CDC and Prevention showed that some 58% of the U.S. population overall and more than 75% of younger children have been infected with the coronavirus since the start of the pandemic in 2020.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at how China celebrated Youth Day with dazzling performances in appreciation of all the youngsters that are making contributions to the country and society. Thank you for watching. Good night.